I am so excited to bring to you this conversation with Dr. Marvin Dunn. He is Professor Emeritus from the Department of Psychology at Florida International University. He has written articles that have appeared in New York Times, the LA Times, the Orlando Sentinel, the Miami Herald. He's the author of multiple books. He's produced three documentaries, including Rosewood Uncovered, which documents the Rosewood Massacre of 1923, not Rosewood, Oklahoma, but Rosewood, Florida, and sadly, not a different story. He's also produced Murder on the Sewanee, the Willie James Howard story, which is the story of the lynching of a 15-year-old Black child in Live Oak, Florida in 1944, and also Black Seminoles in the Bahamas, the Red Bay story, which documents the flight of slaves from Florida escaping to the Bahaman Islands in the 1800s. But here's the part you may not be expecting. He's not only a historian, but he has lived so much history. He's looked eye to eye with President Kennedy. He has interacted with Obama. He has listened to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He has lived so much history, but not only history as in the way back. He just this year was part of a trial as a result of being harassed as a black property owner in an all white town. So sit down, chill, and let's listen to Dr. Marvin Dunn. One of the reasons I reached out to Dr. Dunn is I heard him interviewed talking about the change in Florida's education. And if you've been paying attention to the news at all, you know that they have redesigned history and are taking out the accepted perspective on enslavement in the United States. They've made some adjustments and some tweaks. And so when I heard Dr. Dunn speaking about it, I had to have him on the show. I later come to find out that he is a very unique property owner in Rosewood, Florida, and in fact has experienced modern day efforts to harass Black property owners in a town where all the other property owners are Caucasian American. I know we'll touch on some of that and we'll definitely stick to our regular questions, listeners, but Without any further introduction, except all that came before, I want to say, welcome, Dr. Dunn. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Me too. So we'll zigzag. I'll do my usual questions and then ask you to answer them. I'm sure there'll be follow-up questions that'll get to some of these other topics. So I'm going to just jump in with what is a favorite song or movie, either right now or all time? My favorite song is My Girl. Hey, I have four beautiful daughters and each part of that song speaks to each of my individual babies. That's my favorite song. Oh, I love it. My favorite movie of all time is Gone with the Wind. And why is that? Because it takes me back to that era. It's a visual masterpiece. And it captured life in the South as it was at that time as I experienced it through my ancestors, my grandmother and great-grandmother and talking about about that appearance, and it covers such a sweet of history. So that's my okay. favorite. Can I ask you, because you're a historian, and when you mention Gone with the Wind as a favorite, and then we've got our historical roots in the South, what was it that got you interested in history? That's a good question. That was a riot in Miami in 1980. I was teaching in Florida. International University in Psychology, was really not that much into history. But this event happened in Miami. 18 people, most of them black, died. $100 million worth of damage was done to the city. And I wanted to write the story of Miami and the story of that event. And that's really the thing that drew me into researching the history. But I found out that there was very little written about the black history of Miami. 
And uh, once I found that fact to be the case, I looked a little wider at the history of Blacks in Florida and found even less. Mm. So my, my feeling was that there, there was a terrible uh, lack of information about the history of Black people in Florida and in Miami. And I took 20 years or so to try to gather as much of that history, right? Actually, 30 years to write and mm. research of that history because there was so low of it when I first took back. First glasses. You've got a couple different books on the history of Black Americans in Florida. What do you, and this will be the last question, and we'll go back into our, our normal questions, but what is it that you hope readers will take away from it? Because there's the information they get, right? But then there's the impact that happens from that information. What is the impact you hope they get? Feeling. I want people to feel the history. And the, yeah, those will not necessarily be pleasant feelings, all of them. But I don't, I don't think you can doubt it. Just simply read the written word and think you got the message of what happened 100 years ago. That's why I take people to my property in Rosewood and other places in Florida where some of these terrible things happen. Um, the current view in Florida by our government is that history should be just the facts. Nothing that's going to make anybody mm -hmm. uncomfortable. But I don't know how to teach about an enslaved woman having her child snatched from her breast and sold away and do that without feeling and expect students to listen to that. What, what we have to do now in Florida with the new standards is to teach history in such a way as to not hurt anyone's feelings. It really means not hurting the feelings of white children. I don't think that there's a lot of concern about hurting the feelings of black children, but this impetus came from right wing white parents who but just tired of having their kids learn, hear about slavery and other things that make them feel acceptable. So that's where we are now. And fortunately, teachers cannot really uh, meet this mandate because we simply don't know how, how to teach history in that way. That's the yeah. challenge we now have right now in Florida. Got it. I know that this is going to come back around. As an educator myself, I, I wholeheartedly agree that there are particular people's feelings because there was no concern about teaching slavery when we just said, and slaves and Black students have felt uncomfortable for years, feeling that their heritage is a group of people who were mistreated. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. One of the other things you, you mentioned about your interest in teaching uh, history coming from witnessing, um, I believe it was the riots in Miami. You did uh, riots, yes. correct? You talk about how it's difficult that one of the things you want people to get from a study of history, from your books and from any study of history is to feel it. I love that you then conduct these tours to Rosewood. For our listeners, could you tell them in, in a brief form um, a little bit about Rosewood, Florida, because a lot of folks know about Rosewood, Oklahoma. But if you could tell them just a little bit about Rosewood, Florida, and how you sure. came to own property there. Sure. Rosewood, Florida is located very close to the west coast of Florida, directly uh, west of Gainesville, Florida. It's in central Florida. It was established to harvest ro uh, rosewood trees, which are very expensive cypress trees, very slow growing trees. And that attracted white people there to start harvesting those trees and selling the lumber all over the country. And of course, black people moved in as well. When all of that expensive hardwood was harvested out, the rosewood was all harvested out, the white people left. But black people stayed and leased or purchased large tracts of land and started planting slash pines that you could just grow real fast and sell. And mm. some white folks did very well doing that. 1923, old, old rosewood was almost all black. One or two white families left there and a lot was started in a town two miles away called Sumner by a white woman who saw the black man had assaulted her. That brought a mob to Rosewood looking for this man. It turns out it was a lie. This was this woman's white boyfriend and beat her up and she had to have something to tell her husband about how why she was beaten up. Mm. Mob comes to Rosewood, long story short, they burn the town down. This is a very cold winter. This is January, 1923. A very cold week right around the change of the year. So people are out of their houses and not night clothes into that weather, into that freezing room, 
and then try to find safety. This is a swampy area near the coastline. We had children out there, days, taking care of other children in the night clothes, freezing, covering themselves up with moss and leaves at night. Anyway, all the black people left. Their land was taken over by white people. There are no black people living in Rosewood today. In 2008, I purchased five acres of land in Rosewood, part of the railroad track, railroad that was used to evacuate and save some of the people, runs through my property. So I purchased this land to try to preserve these five acres for history. And, hmm. uh, and that's my interest in Rosewood. And I take the kids up there, teachers to Rosewood, to walk the ground and feel the ancestors and learn what happened uh, during that terrible week. And I noticed one of the emails, addresses I, that I just got, included done tours. And now, is this something that anyone could sign up for through donetours.com? Okay, well, great. let me back up. I started doing, yeah. I started taking high school kids and parents up to Rosewood and two other places, two or three other places that had lynchings. And I call them Teach the Truth Tours. Mm -hmm. And I organized an high profit group that raised the money from donors to be able to do this so the people who go on those tours don't pay anything. We wow. take them for an overnight trip. We stay at a Hilton Hotel or a very nice bus, and we take these folks to Okoe, Rosewood, other places in Florida where these things have happened. But they don't pay anything. The demand for these tours is so great that my folks are saying, we'll pay. We'll pay to go. Yes. So with my son and I and my brother starting done tours. I haven't done the first one yet. Okay. To take the other folks who want to go and who will pay. So we use that website just to have our conversation tonight. Okay, good. Because I do have marathons and I like to travel and do them. When I find one, which I will, that I'll do in Florida, I'm going to be headed up that way because this is what history is meant to be. It's meant to be lived, experienced. And I love that you've taken an opportunity. Would you be willing to st share what happened? Because when I reached out to you, I just w wanted to talk to a Flor Floridian, a historian, about this current issue. And then I find out when I was speaking with you, there was a trial going on. What happened? As I but it's all white. Now, there's some people out there who are very right wing, very conservative. One of those persons is my neighbor across the street. Okay. This is a rural area, so the street is really a room. Okay. He owns a lot of land on the other side of the road. And we were coming up on the 100th year recognition of the Rosewood Master. So I decided to go up and clear off some of my land so people could come and have a ceremony on my property. Mm -hmm. Back in September, I met with two white gentlemen up there, took my son and a couple other people out there with me. And as we were leaving, my neighbor comes up, this big truck that he drives, and he asked me, what's going on out here? And I said, I, this is my property, and I'm getting ready, and I didn't get any further than that. He mm -hmm. said, but that's your property. Why don't you all park on your side of the road? I said, this is a county rule. We'll park where we wish. That's women to a race. He gets in, he jams the truck, the gas, spins around, all, cursing, using racial epithet, holding us. All kinds of names. I won't repeat them. Goes back into his property, comes back a few minutes later, comes out at full speed, and we have to get on the road, else we would have been killed. One of the white men with me called the police. The Levy County police came out, took them through it for days, but they did arrest him. They charged him with using his truck as a weapon, facing those county mm -hmm. charges. Mm -hmm. Now, when I got back to Miami, I don't live up there, but when I got back to Miami, I called the FBI mm -hmm. and I reported this as a hate crime. And they got on it. And just two weeks ago, this man was tried uh, for six counts of a hate crime, all separate from the state crime, uh, in uh, Alachua County, Florida, by an all-white jury, total jury, all-white, mm -hmm. and they found him guilty of six counts mm -hmm. of hate crime. And he's facing 10 years on each count. And his, his sentencing is October 17th. It's just fascinating. I know most... I know many of us, we know that these things happen. What's what I'm sorry to hear that happened. I'm glad to hear that justice has changed in the United States and in Florida. And that despite some of the other issues that are happening in a conservative lead, that he was in fact convicted. Yeah. Alachua County is Trump country. Let me be very clear about mm. this. The mm. country. Mm. Yeah. And they found this man guilty of six counts of hate crime in the Santa's land. He has a sign in front of his yard, the Santa's land. That's a very conservative area, and they still found them guilty. 
I'm so glad to hear that. Congratulations on that victory. And thank you for being someone who pursued it and called the FBI. One of the reasons for the podcast is to have these conversations and also point out the continuance of racial profiling. But it's also true that things have changed enough that, yes, we can call. The sheriff of Lincoln County mm-hmm. called himself and apologized. Mm-hmm. He said, this is not us. I saw this happen to you and the people with you. We're very sorry about that, but this is not us today. And mm-hmm. he gave his first cell number. Mm-hmm. He said, if you have any trouble out of anybody out there, call me anytime, day or night. That's a sheriff of we'll Lincoln County. DeSantis anyway, land. The yeah, that's good. About rules so let, so let, well, let me ask you this. I'm going to actually switch up my questions just a little bit. And I'm going to skip over the childhood question just to go straight into accomplishments. Because I have it that may be part of the difference. And maybe not. But it's also who you are and what you've accomplished in life. Which accomplishment is one that means the most to you personally, Dr. Dunn? And then which accomplishment is the one that when others hear about it, it's the one that tends to get, whoa, or wow. So let's start with that first. Which accomplishment means the most to you personally? Writing the book on the history of Black Miami. Mm -hmm. That took 10 years or more to write. It had not been done before. It will stand the test of time, I hope. But that's a contribution that I hope will live longer into the future. I'm very proud of having done that book because there was nothing, as I said earlier, before that book was written. Fantastic. And then the second part is which which accomplishment is the one that when others hear it, it's the one that gets the wow most often. Yeah, I have seven grandchildren. Really? That's also when I tell my age, because people don't believe I'm 83 years old. Oh, 83 years old. Uh, (laughs) Okay, I just want you to know, I don't know if you heard that sound, but that was my rings when they hit the wall because I went back a little bit. Really, I yeah. pray to be as clear and as good looking when I reach that age. That's awesome. Yeah, that that would be the one that got my well, what? So well, thank you. I would like to claim clean living, but I can't. Okay, good because I that that wouldn't help me if that was it. <laughs> uh, well, I have to have my Jack Daniels bourbon every now and then. I like my- I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I have a thing for Johnny Walker Black, but. So we've seen your accomplishments. We know you care about history. Now I'm going to go back and ask you this question about your own personal history. Of all the experiences you had as a child, what's one moment that is a favorite moment from your childhood? I was born in Deland, Florida. My folks had rented a shotgun house and my dad was a fruit picker. My mom was was just taking care of us five boys. And in 1951, after going up on the migrant season, three years, picking potatoes and apples and beans, my dad was able to get a house in Miami in 1951, in June. Okay. And we moved to that house uh, right before my birthday, 1951. And I'd never been in a house that had electricity or a bathtub, hot and cold running water, a lawn. The house had wet grass. So the first, that day that we want to into that house and I realized I was 11 years old that this was our house. Yeah. Not Mr. Botany's house. The guy we were renting from up in the land. This was my mm-hmm. dad's house. Yeah, that was about to as a kid. I love that. Yeah, that's beautiful. So from there to here, there are obviously going to be some important moments. One of the ones I'm interested in is What is a moment that either changed the trajectory of your life or had a significant impact on your life? The day I met President Kennedy. Oh. Yeah, I was was a naval officer on an aircraft carrier operating out San Diego. That ship had 5,000 men on it, 1,300 officers, and I was the only black officer on that ship. And my job was on the bridge. Mm. A very highly visible position, very yes. strategic position. But I was on the bridge of an aircraft carrier at age 22, helping to run that ship. 1963, they stepped me to that ship. But again, as I said, the Navy didn't have any black officers on ships at that time. And when President Kennedy was being inaugurated, as the different military you know, cadets were going by, he commented that when the Navy's midshipmen came by, that there were no Negroes among them. 
mm-hmm. and the chief of naval operations was sitting behind Kennedy and heard him make that comment about the Navy, not having black officers one day with each branch of the service. Everybody gets the president for one day. And okay. the Navy decided to have him come down a ship for that day. Three yeah. miles with the president. So we were operating off the coast of San Diego, and Kennedy was slated to come out. This is in June of 63. Okay. And I was on the bridge. Everybody was in dress twice. Everybody was over. And we practiced and weeding for the president. And they gave me my watch on the bridge. When the president was over on the bridge, they had me on the bridge. The problem was Kennedy was late. Kennedy was late getting flown out to the ship by a helicopter. We were all you know, waiting for him to come out. And, and my watch was over. And Kennedy hadn't gone there. Uh-huh. So when your watch is over in the Navy, you go to the captain, you say, permission to leave the bridge, sir. The captain says, permission, grant it. It's very routine. I like say, good morning. Yeah. And uh, the other three officers, white officers on watch with me, went to the captain, permission to leave the bridge, sir. Yes, permission, grant it. I go up to the captain, permission. Now, the admirals and generals, all these pe- celebrities on the bridge waiting for Kennedy. I go up, yeah. permission to leave the bridge, captain. They said, no, lieutenant, remain on the bridge. That never happens. That, mm-hmm. that, that, that never happens. Everybody's looking at me. The captain made dunce down the bridge. Never happens. That was so that the president would see me. Mm-hmm. He came on the bridge, which he did. Mm-hmm. He was a lady, finally came, and I was the only, he brought him up to the bridge, and people all fly around shaking his hand and saying hello. And um, he looked miserable. He was miserable. Uh, they had a, had a bad back. They'd thrown out a special chair from the White House for him, mounted it on the captain's ship ears. So mm. he, he would be comfortable, but he was very uncomfortable. He could tell it in his face. His yeah. personal doctor was with him this morning. Anyway, for about five seconds, his eyes met my eyes. Mm. And very deep blue eyes this man had. Painful, pained eyes, I thought. He looked like he was in deep pain. And for those few seconds, I thought just he and I were the only ones who didn't want to be up there. He was good. And then, yeah. That was in June, that November, he was killed oh. in Dallas. Wow. But I decided to get out of the Navy because I realized they were using me to window dress for the president mm-hmm. of, the state, of the United States. And I didn't want to be used that way. I enjoy, I'd never regretted going to sea. I love the Navy. Mm-hmm. But uh, once that happened, I decided to, be, to get out. Could you just live history? The your favorite memory being the purchase of your fam- first family home, and that's such a milestone for African Americans in every community. This is a thing, and then to also have met Kennedy and I find correct me if I'm wrong. I want to emphasize this for the listeners. There were 1,300 officers on this ship, and you were the only black officer. Right. Did I hear that correctly? Okay. That, that was the USS Kitty Hawk. Three years later, they sent me to another carrier in Saratoga. It was about a turning sea. Mm-hmm. I was the only black officer on that ship, too. So mm-hmm. that was the experience in the Navy. I was just about to say, on behalf of all those that you led the way for, thank you. Even though I, I have not served, I still appreciate those who came before all alone and made it possible, made it acceptable, created the space for others to follow. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for your service. What about a moment, conversation, or event that either highlights or in some way signifies your experience as a Black man in the United States? Something, it can be something very fortifying and positive, or it could be something that's, this is what it is to be a black man in the U.S. I got admitted to Morehouse College when I was 16 years old. I was 17 by the time I got on the bus and I'm going to go okay. to Atlanta to go Thanks. to Morehouse. But I got admitted to college early, so I got to leave. This was seven. My mom and my dad and my grandmother took me down to the Grand bus station downtown Miami. They had a little brown bag lunch, a little cardboard suitcase, mm-hmm. uh, sweet potato the pet chips, and they put me in the back seat of that bus. Mm. And my mom and my grandmother said, now you stay, honey, we're going to pray for you. And it was a, this was a Sunday night. The bus was going to get me to Atlanta that next day, Monday. So you stay on it right where we put you in the mall until that bus gets to Atlanta. And they got off. And my mom and my grandmother were sanctified. They were sanctified one day. They went to church. Mm-hmm. And then my dad got on the bus. And my dad was not sanctified. He didn't okay. go to church. He was along shore. He was in the docks. He came okay. up to me. 
And when my dad raised five sons, and when he wanted to get our attention, he would use the N-word as a little, mm. listen a little later, listen to me. Don't you move your ass off the back seat of this bus till you get to London. You got that? Okay, Pop, I got it. I got it. And he gets off, the bus takes off, and it gets about 35, 40 miles to uh, almost to West Palm Beach. And I got up and moved to the middle of the bus. Mm. I don't know what, as my mother asked me, what possessed me to do that, but it felt mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. Said it, somehow or another, it, it felt better. And now that Sunday night, there were people getting on the bus, white people sitting behind me now. So the next morning, that bus was in Way Way Cross, Georgia, and some white high school kids were using that Greyhound bus to get to school. And they get on the bus, they're talking, and a white girl sat down right next to me, talking to her friends. I had never been that close to a white person. And as soon as that child sat down next to me, you could hear a pin drop on that bus. Mm -mm. Everybody stopped talking. And then finally, somebody said, nigga, get up. A white person sitting behind me. The nigga, get up, get back there where you belong. Yeah. And then other people chimed in. What's the matter with you? Get, get. And uh, there were some black folks in the very back of the bus. Come on, honey, come on back. Come on. Come yes. Back, honey. And before I did anything, this white Marine in uniform, he was a corporal, he stood up and said, Why are you bothering him? He's not. And they forgot about me and jumped on him. Are you, you serious? You must be from up north. You must be a Jew. You don't, you don't know how we do things here. Now, that bus by now is outside of Waycross. So the driver pulls up into a service station and comes back and he says to me, you are creating a disturbance on this bus. I'm putting you off. And he did. Gave him all those suitcase and said, you wait for the next bus to Atlanta. It'll be by three hours. And I did. And that bus took off. Now, when that, when that second bus came by and I got on it, where do you think I sat? On the very back of the bus. The back seat, like my folks took home in the first place. Yeah. But yeah, that was a realization for the first time in my life that I could be killed. Because I was like, I, I, it, it didn't come to that, but I felt threatened. Yeah. As a Black person, for the first time I felt threatened. And would you say that, because I know in the 50s, I'm going to guess that Miami itself was still fairly segregated. Am I correct in that? Yes. Through the okay. Yes. Yes. And so I'm going to be like your mom. So what made you move? I'm in, I actually, I don't really mean what made you move, but I guess I'm wondering. So even though Miami was still segregated, I'm guessing then the experience of race relations, it did not feel like the rest of the South, rural South. Would that, is that accurate? That, that you didn't Ooh, anticipate? Yes, it was. Oh, really? Oh, no, Miami, no, that's a misconception. Okay, I'm glad I Miami asked. Miami was just as Southern, just as racist. The folks who settled Miami were from Georgia. White folks who settled Miami came from Georgia and South Carolina. So, no, Miami tried to paint this picture of being different, exotic, and all of that. It was a rural, Southern, racist, segregated, dangerous town for Black people. Just like Jacksonville. Okay. It got better after the Second World War. A lot of white folks from the North and Jews started moving to Miami. Then gotcha. the context of well, well, the, the composition of the white community changed. So the, 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 the red Mexico got replaced by folks coming in who just were not of that particular belief system. Okay. Then in that case, you know what I'm going to take away from your story as an educator of high school students? I'm going to remember that is just how high school students are. <laughs> you can tell them, look, you got to do this and you got to do this. And I mean it. Now do it like this. And they're going to be like, mm, let me just try. To... <laughs> it goes way back. Yeah. I, and I'm glad it didn't turn out. It sure I'm glad that, and I, I'm glad that all that happened was you got to put off the bus and you got back on. And we are here to talk today about all the accomplishments you've done. In you know, 1961, I finished Morehouse and I rode back to Miami. Uh, yeah. That June, and I sat behind the driver really? of the web because by that time, the civil rights law had been passed and you no longer had to sit in the back of the bus. So between 57 to 61, that, that change took place. So you were at Morehouse during the Freedom Rides? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was at Morehouse from 57 to, to 61. You know, King had just left. In fact, before he became famous, 
They were bring came back to Morehouse to, to, to try to talk to preach to us. Oh, they wow. just left a few years before us, but the baby bring because Morehouse College was a Baptist college, so we had to go to chapel five days a week. Ooh. And, and they had to find some preachers to fill those five days a week. So when things got thin, they did invite this little preacher from Alex, so, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. to come in and just fill up a, 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 a session. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm going to admit something to y'all that, that don't let this get out. Okay, okay. I won't tell. And my Manny, listeners Manny, not going to tell nobody either. Okay. Manny Jackson was in my class. He became mayor of, of, of Atlanta. Yeah. Manny Jackson. Julian Bond was in my class. All right. Uh-huh. Martin Luther King Jr. came to. Yes. When Martin Luther King Jr. came to speak to my house, man, we slept. I'm loving it, Sammy. I can't tell you one thing. Thanks, said He was boring. Oh, now when his daddy came, when oh, Luther boy. King came to speak, and you messed up then, because he, he was one of the biggest preachers in Atlanta. But no, little, little <laughs> Jack Leg, Martin Luther King Jr. Oh man, don't even back to keep the pajamas on on, his, on your clothes. I'm talking to contemporaries of famous people. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that because no, nobody remembers that part. <laughs> yeah, and when, every time you hear people when Martin Luther King all day long and they play the same speeches, do you sometimes think back and go, "Man, oh man, they don't even know how far he grew." <laughs> a, re- a recent friend his brother was in my class. I, I met him that first day I got to Morehouse. Goodness, yes. I know. I've heard stories. I'm a California girl, and I went to all California schools, college, and, and grad. But I, I still knew all about Morehouse, and I, I won't lie. If there had been a Morehouse man that had wanted me, I'd have, I'd have said, hey. Well, uh, it was a great place to go to school. I met some very wonderful people, and, and I met Aretha. The, 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 week I, the day uh, that I got to Morehouse, that's the same day Cecil got there, a brother. Okay. And I was just there, a new arrival, and you know, uh, Aretha and Cecil's daddy was a very famous preacher, Reverend C.L. Okay. Franklin. I remember yeah, it from the movie. Franklin. Yes, indeed. Robert C. L. Franklin. So we're sitting there, and here comes two canary yellow for Cadillac convertibles driving up to the campus. One was being driven by Cecil Franklin, and the other was driven by his sister Aretha behind him. Wow. And, and he comes, he has a process hair, he's wearing more of a suit. And what a, a scene they made to come out to Morehouse that, that, uh, that day. We're just sitting in awe. Anyway, uh, Dr. Benjamin D. Mays was the president of Morehouse. He was a legend, a legendary educator. Given mm-hmm. the first black superintendent of, of students for, for Atlanta. Anyway, that next day, Dr. Mays called Cecil into his office. Uh-huh. Told him, get that process cut off your head. Uh-uh. Uh, have your sister come back and get that Cadillac. Okay. And get some clothes, that, uh, decent clothes. For it. And the next uh, Sunday, Aretha comes back. And guessed the car and took took it back to Detroit. But the afternoon that they came, I remember they went to the band room and they were singing. Aretha and her sister and Cecil just took over and started singing. And then she left and that's then they came back the next week to the guitar. More oh my gosh. Like the play that she out stuff. You didn't show out at Morehouse. He it's... passed away. Uh, the, the waitress. Um... So you. <laughs> So the people you went to school with, being on the bridge when uh, President Kennedy comes by, getting to hear a little bit of Aretha singing, you just, wow. That's quite a life you've lived. So I ask every brother about your experiences with law enforcement. To paint a picture, what would you like to say about your experiences with law enforcement? Either a particular example or experience, or because you've already regaled us with so many stories, just a generalized view. I was arrested at one time in my life. Mm. Okay. I was actually running for office. I was campaigning for, for the legislature. And I was out with my campaign manager in the Grove area of Miami, coming from an event. And I was driving, and she was uh, in the car with me. And as we approached this, this convenience store, there was big melee going on. Kids in the streets going ahead, throwing things at each other. And there were several police cars there as we drove up. And they apparently got the kids separated and had gotten them moved out of the way. But the police cars were still blocking the road, so you really couldn't get in. So as we were sitting there waiting to try to get in to park at the store, the window was down, and I made the comment that the police were causing more problems than the kids were. 
Mm-hmm. How many officers heard me say that? Uh-uh. What did you say? I said, kids have all gone. It looks like you're all causing more of a delay right now than, 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 than the kids were. Get out of the car, sir. Excuse me, get out of the car, sir. Got out of the car. Where's your driver's license? As it turns out, I, I didn't have my license on me. Mm-hmm. I, you, know, that, and you don't have your license? No. Put your hands on the, on the hood. You're under arrest. And put me in the back of a police car. And as the scene is being cleared away, the sergeant comes, because this is the last time with me sitting in the back seat with this officer. And the sergeant comes over and says, so who is this? Who is this? And I, I hear him tell the sergeant, oh, that's just an asshole who just got in the way. Hmm. So the sergeant then rolls the window down and asks me, what's your name, sir? I said, oh, I'm just the asshole who got in the way, sir. I said, yeah, but you did it. No, you didn't. I did. My mother told me, boy, your mouth will be your ruin. And my brothers will tell you, my mother said that to me my whole life. Your mouth will be your ruin. Yeah, he took my behind to jail, locked me up. My wife had to come and get me at 2 o'clock in the morning. But yeah, that was my memorable experience of being arrested the only time I've been arrested. <laughs> okay, but I, that I, was I never funny told those stories before, actually. Yeah, really? I never told those stories. Thank you for sharing it with us. I, I'm glad that all that happened was you were you got put in jail. At what point, I do have to ask you, at what point did they realize you were also running for public office? state? And I, I gather this is statewide office. Yeah. I knew that. It, it, it didn't matter. Okay. It didn't matter. They were okay. upset because I was mouthing off. I couldn't yeah. do anything. Was a Look, well, I just, I have to add money. I've been real good about keeping my mouth shut, but I have to add this. And it is not even close to your story, but I have to say, I remember being at junior high school and there was some tension between black and white students. It wasn't anything big, no big riot or anything like that, but just a little bit of tension. And this white girl, she was, uh, her parents had to come pick her up because there was a bunch of drama and she was almost in a fight. And I saw her and I didn't like her. And as her and her mom were leaving, I said, I can't stand Renee, blah, blah, blah. And that got me into the principal's office. <laughs> and, and I get it, too, because I was aggravating. It, it was just the wrong time to say that. And I'll tell you what, I think my mouth has been not much better. A little bit better. But uh, anyway, so I, I, I know sometimes you got to say what you got to say. If the United States was a woman with whom you could speak, mother, lover, stranger, friend, neighbor, you call it. The U.S. was a woman. What would you say to her? Stop the pain. That's what women do. That's what mothers do. If we're going to be healed as a nation, it'll be the women that'll do it. It won't be the men. Stop the pain. Got it. Yeah, I like that. I, I wish that. I make that a prayer. Love heals pain. I ask every brother about a moment that exemplifies love. It doesn't have to be the best example of love, but what is a moment that exemplifies what love is for you? Seeing each of my children the first time that it, as they were born. Seeing my babies for the first time. And then you, you realize that's the life that you created and that you're responsible for. That, that's the important part, too, that you are responsible for. Mm. That life you just made, yeah, that, that's the best example I can give. And what I take from that is that with the joy comes responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And you wear that. I, that just come, my dad was a good example, raving five kids. Uh, with for all the kinds of things he had to deal with as a black man coming up in Florida in the 1930s and 40s. He set an example, getting on that orange truck every morning to go out and pick the fruit, no matter how cold it was, mm. taking abuse from white people that I saw and heard him take. But yeah, I had a good example. My dad never left us. Uh, every paycheck, every pay they didn't pay black men in checking in the cash. Mm-hmm. Couldn't even have it, right? But he brought his money home to give it to my mother. And then she would give him what he could have to go out and do what he wanted to do. He brought his, his pay home to my mother every Saturday. Here it is. Mm. And then she would give him a little bit out and do his little ball and back and what have you. Yeah. So. 
Family first. That's what I hear. So the question I didn't ask earlier that I'm now going to come back to is, what is a favorite quote, saying, metaphor, book? Love thy neighbor. You know why I'm saying that right now? Please. Because I have a neighbor that's difficult to love. That's trying to kill me and my son with his truck. And I'm a Christian person. I don't go to church as much as I should. But I learned that much. Love that mm-hmm. neighbor. Mm-hmm. How do you love somebody who tries to kill you, calling you a nigga? So I got to work that one out. But that's the best answer I can give you a question. And where are you on that? I don't know. I don't know. The trial's on the 17th of October. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that. Yeah. I acknowledge that you're even grappling with it. I think there are many a person who would say that love thy neighbor is for a whole lot of people, but not that way. And the fact that you dare to grapple with it says a lot about your character and your spirituality. My last question of our set. You've met a lot of people in your lived life. I ask you, if you could spend five hours with any other Black man, living or deceased, who would you choose and what would you do or what would you talk about? Uh, Obama. I met, I met him once. I didn't have mm-hmm. enough time with him. Mm-hmm. If I had enough generally to do that, I would spend that time with Barack. Not just because he was a black man who became president, but because he is such a wonderful soul. Mm-hmm. He truly is a wonderful soul who took good care of this country when it was his responsibility to do it. So I would want to spend more time, spend those hours with Barack Obama and share some stories. Okay. I just want you to know, listeners, I, I just have to put this in for my listeners because I know you're like, Robin, I didn't even hear you ask. Like, all the, you know, so many things I could have sworn you were going to dig in on. I am respecting this brother's time. And you got to hear an amazing life. And I'm glad you got to hear his words. This has been a magnificent experience for me. One of the things that's beautiful about the podcast for me as the host is who I get to talk to. In a moment, I'll share what I got from it. But I asked, the last question I asked each brother is, what did you get for yourself, Dr. Dunn, out of having this conversation? A new buddy that, that I can joke with, we can talk yes. from time to time. <laughs> and, and I think I, I got to be heard by the people who listen to your, your podcast. I got that out of it. It's important to me to be heard. That's what I got out of it. And that's a Perfect. lot for me. Yeah, I'm going to have links in the show so, notes. Yeah, we, I got a feeling we'll be talking another time. Look, you can count on it because I really am coming on that tour. I've got to be, I've got to see this place that the the history of it is so fascinating. So I'm looking forward to doing one of these done tours. And and for my listeners, I will have links in the show notes, not only to done tours, but to Dr. Dunn's books. And you can find so many interviews that he's done If you want to hear more about things he said about the Florida education law, our podcast is about the person, but there's plenty out there. Don has a lot of my stuff up. Donhistory.com. A lot of stories, films, interviews with people. Please go there and and visit. Perfect. Donhistory.com. I'll have a link in the show notes. And Dr. Don, this is not what I normally do, but I want you to have the last word. What would you like to say to my listeners, to anyone who might happen to find this interview? I would say it is not as bad as it seems. I've been here before. As a people, it is not as bad as it seems. The storm is passing over. I have hope. I am heartened by that. Thank you. Thank you for listening to 365 Brothers. Certainly hope you enjoyed the episode. I encourage you to subscribe. Please leave a review. I want to know what you think. Also, if you know someone who would be a fantastic guest for 365 Brothers, please direct them to our website, 365brothers.com. You'll also find all the episodes there, 365brothers.com. 
and your support is welcome. And remember, to listen is to love.